Iran is high on the agenda as the GCC summit kicks off. As Gulf leaders in Riyadh and European powers in Vienna try to cement their stance on Iran's nuclear ambitions, Tehran accuses the West of playing games. Can the nuclear deal be salvaged before time runs out? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Iran. Well, the past few days have seen a flurry of diplomatic activity surrounding Iran, from Vienna to Riyadh, Amman to Abu Dhabi, there have been measured efforts underway to engage in diplomacy rather than isolation. But disagreement over how Iran manages its nuclear program is in part what's preventing real progress. Negotiations resumed in Vienna with the P5 plus one warning Tehran that this was its last chance to come to the table with a serious resolution. Iran, though, says its Western parties who broke the 2015 nuclear deal and continue trying to blame Iran for the West's violation of the agreement. Still, the U.S. is warning Tehran of consequences if progress isn't made quickly. We continue in this hour, on this day, to pursue diplomacy because it remains, at this moment, the best option. But we are actively engaging with allies and partners on alternatives. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia has held direct talks with its regional rival aimed at improving relations. The two cut diplomatic ties back in 2016, and today Riyadh and Tehran stand on opposing sides of several regional disputes, but perhaps most notably, the war in Yemen, where a Saudi-led coalition is battling the Iran-aligned Houthi group. Now, direct talks were launched in April in an effort to improve ties. Participants from Tehran and Riyadh met again in Jordan's capital on Monday. The Saudi Kingdom says no major results were achieved, but before the meeting even started, they were warning Tehran about playing games. The Iranians take a long-term attitude towards these talks. We are not interested in talks for the sake of talks or for the sake of uh, photo opportunities. We would like to push these discussions towards substantive issues uh, that uh, involve the behavior of the Iranian government in the region and we hope that the Iranians will be able to respond uh, in kind to, to this effort. But as long as the Iranians continue to play games with these talks, they are not going to go anywhere. And a historic meeting was also held this week between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Abu Dhabi's crown prince, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, hosted Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in their first ever public meeting. Israel's ambassador to the UAE says the tricky issue of Iran was high on their agenda. While the two share concerns about Iran's activities, the UAE has also been trying to improve relations with Tehran. The visit is seen as Israel's latest push to isolate Iran by strengthening relationships with Muslim-majority Arab powers in the region, an initiative led by the United States. We talked about the relative strengths of both countries and our goal is to expand the relationship in order to make peace between people and not just peace between leaders. I leave here with great optimism that this example of relationship between the two states will be a cornerstone for a widespread net of contacts across the region. So as Iran's neighbors and the world explore new ways to engage with or confront Tehran, where will nuclear talks go and how will the GCC reshape its policy? Well, to discuss that and more, I'm joined now from Vienna by Mohammed Mirandi. He's an advisor to Iran's nuclear negotiating team and a professor at Tehran University. Jeffrey Stacey is also with us. He was an, a senior advisor to the U.S. State Department under the Obama administration. And Simon Mabin is a professor of international politics at Lancaster University, also the author of The Struggle for Supremacy, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Thanks all so much for being with us. Uh, let's start with the Vienna talks uh, and Anthony Blinken saying, you know, the United States is preparing alternatives in case these talks fail. Jeffrey Stacey, it first has to be asked what alternatives he's talking about. What are the options? Well, there aren't a great deal, like compared to, say, the Russia case, where obviously you start with sanctions and then you add the delivery of defensive armaments and things like that. Here, things are, in a way, um, 
in terms of stakes, just as high. But next steps, you know, as the new British foreign minister was outlining, are rather unclear. After diplomacy, what is there? Brinkmanship of exactly what kind? So I think the emphasis is pointing out that the loss of the talks entirely for the Iranians is entirely not a good option at this time. It is really rather the time for confidence building measures. How about with the United States in the same room? How about let the IAEA engage in new negotiation or er, inspections? And then we can start to work on the timing of what will come first, relief of sanctions or progress on reducing levels of enrichment and these sorts of things. The table is set, including in the GCC. Okay. We need now progress on the Iranian side. Something from the Iranian side. Let me ask Mohammed Morande, who has been on the Iranian side, and you've been watching the, uh, the Vienna talks from beginning to end. Uh, first of all, you keep hearing this, this warning that time is running out as an Iranian, that now that the U.S. is exploring alternatives, uh, if these talks fail, uh, what does Iran make of all this? We've been hearing that time is running out for decades now. But uh, the Americans and the Europeans don't have many options. They're already using maximum pressure. They're targeting women and children through sanctions. It's, they're waging war against ordinary people, and they've been doing it for quite a while. And even though Biden criticized Trump for this policy, we see that he's pursuing the same policy. So when you have maximum pressure, there's not much more you can do. You can sanction me, and then you can sanction me again, but I'm still sanctioned anyway. On the other hand, the, no one believes that the United States is going to engage in military conflict because, I mean, after Afghanistan and with the rise of China and Russia, I think it's quite clear that that is just simply not an option. Iran is too powerful. It has too many regional allies. It's not a war that, any, that, that anyone can win. So the smart thing from the Iranian perspective is for the Americans and the Europeans to agree to go back to 2015. What the Americans want to do is basically what Trump wanted to do. And that is that they want to use these maximum pressure sanctions to gain leverage, to get more than what they were to get in the JCPOA. And the Iranians won't accept that, especially this administration, which uh, is going to be more rigorous in its defense of Iranian sovereignty. So the Iranians are yeah. saying that, you, you know, you've, you've broken the deal, you tore up the deal, you've caused hundreds of billions of dollars of damage. And then for you to say that Iran should give concessions or that Iran should be brought back to the table is, is, is uh, you know, it's extraordinary okay. because the only country that's actually stayed at the table is Iran. Is Iran. Okay. Je I mean, Jeffrey, Stacey, I just have to come back to you quickly because we've been hearing really from Iran the same state of affairs since 2018. It is a very, very simple solution yes. from the Iranian perspective. And now they're saying, listen, time is not running out uh, and your threat to look at alternatives. There's nothing more the United States can even do at this point. Is that true? Not entirely, but um, with all respect to my friend, um, that's rather a broken record on the Iranian side. It's time for some actual movement, and we can synchronize these moves. I'm entirely in favor of co-timing the moves so that there is a little relief of sanctions. There's a little less enrichment. There's a little more relief of sanctions. There are some new inspections. There are many, many ways to do this. So if we talk about uh, Mr. Raisi and this more rigorous line, that's not really helping. That's why there was a very stern response from the new British foreign minister and her European counterparts. So it's time for our Iranian friends to show that they are actually interested in that deal and adhering okay. to it. Okay, let me ask Simon Maben as an observer. You know, when you, you've been following these for a long time, um, you're a keen Iran observer, and we're hearing this kind of over and over, especially in recent months, that time is running out, that these negotiations really aren't coming to the conclusion. 
uh, that many had hoped for as quickly as they wanted. But are, are you really worried? Uh, is there something ominous now on the horizon because these talks have not concluded and because the 2015 JCPOA has not been reinstalled? Well, I, I don't want to speculate about an ominous future. I think with the world the way that it is right now, we've got enough to worry about without adding to that. I think I, sh I should just quickly respond by, by saying that it's hard for trust to be built when one side has walked away from the table and the other is then expected to, to be the one to make that step to build the trust. I think the, the, the decision, President Trump's decision to withdraw from the deal has had serious repercussions and continues to reverberate. The idea that, that Iran should be the one to take that step seems a little bit counterintuitive given what has happened previously, and we should not discount that. But the, the speed of the talks is a really important thing, um, and I think speed is, is quite relative here. The Iranians, they're happy to play the long game. The Iranians are thinking strategically about the longer term here. It's not about getting a deal in the next month or six months or, or, or year or so. It's about getting the right deal over time, and they're happy to do that. Now, for the Americans, for perhaps the Saudis, for the Israelis, a deal or not a deal in case of the Israelis, I guess, is, is, a much more, is, is more of a matter of urgency. So time is, is relative. It depends whose perspective we're dealing with. And that, I guess, would get to the point of your question. Um, okay. Whose sense of pressure is the most, uh, most urgent? Fair enough. Let's look at the other angle here. And we know representatives from Saudi and Iran met uh, in Jordan uh, and if anyone was hoping, you know, for that to notably ease diplomatic tensions, it, it hasn't really. Saudi now says Iran is, is not being pragmatic uh, and Riyadh wants more substantive talks. Simon, let me ask you, I mean, is Iran potentially avoiding substance then for right now until it sees where the Vienna talks actually go? Possibly. I mean, the two are, are, are certainly linked, but they are dealing with different sets of issues. The talks in Jordan build on talks that were held in Iraq, and they're more about regional security. It's more about the Saudis wanting guarantees that the war in Yemen will not spill over into the Saudi kingdom, as it has done over the past few years. The Saudis want Iranian reassurance that, that the Houthis, the Houthi rebels, will be curtailed. They will not be able to, to attack the kingdom. And that's one of the key hurdles that needs to be overcome in this bilateral set of discussions about regional security. And... The Iranians have, have made steps. They've, they've said that they've talked to the Houthis, that they've presented these plans to the Houthis, but obviously haven't come back with the guarantees that the Saudis need. So what we're seeing now there is an equal set of, of posturing. The Saudis are posturing, the Iranians are posturing. Both sides ultimately pragmatically need some type of agreement in terms of regional security. But it's a high stakes game of poker here and there's posturing going on. Okay, but I mean, uh, let me ask Jeffrey then, you know, the GCC is also talking about the JCPOA. It's very much on the table, but as you know, Simon was saying and others have said, Iran is playing the long game here. Um, so what do you think? Uh, Simon seems to think these are two separate entities entirely, but many think there are very, the two are very much connected. What the GCC does is, is pertinent to what is happening uh, at in Vienna right now, so where do you, how do you see? Well, that, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, that's true. For example, when the GCC internal crisis kicked off, Qatar moved right into stronger relations with Iran, and not entirely surprising at the time, and and not really negative. It's important that the GCC finally puts to bed its internal tensions. And that actually is happening. We're seeing especially uh, progress with UAE and their, their own direct relations with Iran. Um, Saudis have continued this so-called back channel. It's, it's more like a front channel these days because it's, there's no secret about it. But yes, uh, Simon is quite correct to say that um, movements um, with the Yemen situation would be very helpful if the Houthis were to sit down with the UN Special Representative and begin to make some moves. Well, that would entirely help the negotiations in Vienna over a new nuclear deal. Oh, okay. 
Uh, Mohammed Morandi, as far as, you know, the GCC is concerned and these comments that really Iran is just not being pragmatic and that they want to see more substance, um, is that the case? Is Iran intentionally uh, playing the long game, as Simon put it, and we've heard others say the same, or is that just not true? Has Iran been progressive in these talks? Well, first of all, the nuclear negotiations have nothing to do with the GCC or anything else. They're about Iran's nuclear program and Western sanctions that are directed specifically towards women and children, civilians, and they are, uh, uh, they're, they're, the, the Americans and the Europeans are waging warfare against ordinary okay, people. Okay, so Just what, like is, what, what they, does Iran want out of the GCC then? The GCC is not a monolithic entity, as we all know. Until recently, there was a siege on Qatar, and the differences and the divide in the GCC is 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 very substantial. For Iran, the issue of Saudi Arabia and Yemen is not so simple. The Saudis have carried out a genocidal war in the country, and effectively, the government is the government in Sanaa. The very fact that after six, seven years of Western support and genocidal support, genocidal on behalf of the Americans, the British, the Canadians, the Germans. They gave the Saudis everything to destroy Yemen, whatever they needed. And their advisors are helping the Saudi Air Force to bomb Yemen day and night. Uh, and of course, there's a, a literally a starvation siege that for years has been, this is something unprecedented in, in contemporary human history. But despite that, they've been, they failed in the war. And that shows that the, the, the regime that the Saudis and the Americans and the Europeans have tried to prop up is completely okay. illegitimate in the eyes of the population. Okay. So despite the siege, despite the barbaric siege, the, the Saudis have failed. Okay. And the Saudis have to accept the reality on the ground in Yemen. The Yemeni people okay, are Mohammed not Iranian proxies. I, I do want to come back. I, I actually want to raise the, the Vienna talks again. But first of all, uh, Jeffrey, Stacey, I'll let you have a quick comment because I could see you, you very much disagreed with what you were hearing. So do finish with that. Go ahead. Well, my friend, it, it's not helpful to fire all these salvos about genocide and warfare by other means and play the blame game in every direction. What we need now is constructive steps. We can do confidence building measures. We can do simultaneous moves of relief of sanctions. And how many times do I need to say how this is right in front of us? If the posturing would reduce as well, we can make progress rather rapidly. And May I make a point? Long game, medium game, all this is posturing. Let's negotiate. Okay. Let's do something for the Iranian people, for the entire region, for the world. Let's make progress. Uh, you know, Mohammed Morandi, uh, Ali Bagheri Khan actually said a few days ago that progress has been made in this latest round of talks in Vienna. They believe the, uh, Tehran is being pragmatic. Tell us where. What does Iran see as progress here? And ha how has Iran been the good negotiating partner so that what Jeffrey Stacey is saying really isn't true? Well, the problem with what, Jay, uh, what, what he's saying is that, what Jeffrey is saying, is that uh, it is the United, A, as I said before, it's the United States that tore up the deal and targeted ordinary people. And that is a, a real issue. People have died. It's not something that we can just throw in the bin. And the United States, as we speak, is targeting ordinary people. That's something that we cannot negate. The Iranians have said, and as I told, and as I said earlier, the Iranians stayed in the deal when the Americans left. So if anyone says that the Iranians are buying time, well, they could have. The Iranians could have left the deal right after Trump left, or a month afterwards. But they stayed on a full year, and then afterwards they gradually decreased their commitment. So that doesn't. So that runs against the argument that the Americans are making. The Iranians right now are saying, oh, we'll go "Okay, no, well, no, I, I, no." The Iranians right now are saying we will go back and fully implement our obligations, but the Americans and the Europeans have to fully implement their obligations. They, Trump, set up a series of sanctions. So how are these talks making progress the this way the Ali Bagheri Khani has said? Not That's the uh, Trump administration. How, how well, are let these me combine talks what he said making with progress? Your question. Go ahead. Well, the talks are making progress 
very slow progress in the sense that initially the Europeans on be and on behalf of the Americans were resisting the two additional Iranian texts. Now we see movement on the ground in that regard. But the point is that the, the, the sticking point, the sticking point is not the nuclear program here. The sticking point is that the Iranians are saying Trump's maximum pressure sanctions, whatever they were Biden's about, human, human rights, well, he's continuing with those sanctions. Whatever reason they were for, if it, whether human rights, the, the whole sanctions regime is a violation of human rights, whether it's terrorism, the United States is constantly terrorizing, trying to terrorize Iranian people, whatever. But the whole maximum pressure campaign is founded upon a series of sanctions that were intended, under different names, to make Iran submit to the United States and to change the nuclear deal. Trump, before he became president, he spoke Absolutely about it not. throughout. Go and read Pompeo's statements, his 12-point statement. It's it's very clear. Former what administration, well. my friend. Biden is continuing with the same policy. The Iranians are saying, if you want us to go back to 2015, you have to go back to 2015. And in fact, all Biden of these administration is in the Vienna are, talks, all my friend. Of, the Biden administration is resisting and they don't want to give up these sanctions. So the Iranians are saying, if you give up your sanctions, okay, I'll tell you we what, will go back to the deal. We know that, and, we know that. But there's one, well, there's one additional point here. And that is that the, the, the United States it is resisting. It wants to keep a right. series of sanctions. We've heard that. We know. I, I, the, pro, the, the clock is against us. I mean, uh, Simon Mabin, I, I want to get some, some last words in then here. We, we do have a, some time left. I mean, how does this get better? Uh, the United States is now, yeah, they're not going back to 2015, and that's just the way it is. But Iran is either saying, this is what you're going to do, or we're not moving. Um, really, what are the what are the solutions here? That's the million dollar question, I guess. And I think what what we've heard from my two colleagues on the panel are the two staunchly opposing views, and it's difficult to look past those views. The Iranians saying, "Look, maximum pressure is killing people, killing Iranians, and it's it's having a devastating effect." And the Americans are saying, "Well, we need to we need to get some show of goodwill." It's it's difficult to negotiate when you have two opposing and attract intractable positions, there needs to be some type of creative solution. I think Jeffrey's solution of, of concurrent steps is a good one, but there's certainly no doubt that the maximum pressure campaign initially imposed by the Trump administration and continued by the Biden administration is having a devastating effect on people. There has to be some way of building trust. The Americans need to show a sign of good faith. The Iranians need to show a sign of good faith. Getting that initial act, getting those initial yeah, yeah. Um, tokens of good faith from both sides, and it is important that they need to be both sides, that is the first Indeed. step. And it may be that's where you can draw in some of the, the talk about Yemen. And just on the Yemen point, I must say that there are very few actors that come out of that war with any credibility whatsoever. And I think that's really Especially important. Especially the British. Of course. More than anyone. Well, let's have a ceasefire, my friends. Let's have a ceasefire in Yemen. We could start there. These are linked. The relations inside the GCC are linked. Or we can just decide for some concurrent steps. I'm happy if the United States would go first and reduce a specific sanction or set of sanctions if the Iranians in advance will agree to respond in kind. No, there's no there reason for Iran to do anything in advance. There are many the ways Ameri to do this. The Americans violated the forward. deal. The Americans violated the deal. The Americans cannot They're in Vienna. The Americans the are in Vienna, my friend. The Iranians to show goodwill. The Americans have to How show let us that they the are willing to, talk to you implement. And then well, we they, can they have really to earn move. that right. They have to earn that right. They left the table, not Iran. It was their choice. Biden, when he I became I think we've been doing this for some time. Biden, when he became president, wow. he could have immediately reversed. These negotiations we know have this. Been going uh, on again, for again, some we've been. Time. Yeah, we're we're going over exactly the same territory. You know, Simon, we just have a couple minutes left. In fact, a minute and a half. Uh, let Let me ask you. I mean. Fundamentally, why are these talks and this issue still important? Because you hear. Uh, arguably more and more people saying, you know, Iran really, for 25 years we've been hearing that Iran has wanted to build yep. a nuclear bomb, and they could have, 
And they would have if it mattered to them, and they're not. So really, is, is talking about this nuclear issue just a card being played to engage Iran anyway? To be able to negotiate, to get them back into the international community? So I don't know, maybe uh, oil can flow more freely? Or is there, I mean, I'm asking if there's really something else at play here. No, I think nuclear negotiations matter. That okay. preventing the spread of nuclear weapons is absolutely essential, and it has been um, since the Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1967, ratified in 1970. Nuclear non-proliferation is so important. And of course, with But the that, head of the CIA um, said there's no indication that Iran ever was trying to produce a nuclear weapon or that it is trying to do so. So I was the, this in whole general issue okay, is, I'll tell you what, let Simon is being up used to suppress Because Iranian we're going to have to finish. Simon, finish quickly. So nu preventing nuclear proliferation is essential, but so too is removing sanctions that are having a devastating impact on the Iranian people. And I think all parties would agree that the current situation is not a good one. And I think the Iranians and the Americans and the Europeans would like to find a resolution. Okay. They want to improve the situation for people. You're here. Okay, Simon, you will have the last word because unfortunately we are out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for being with us. And to our viewers as well, remember you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore Newsmakers and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.